Um, <clears throat> as it happens, I, I'm not employed by APCO, so if I am, the cheque must be in the post. Uh, I'm an independent barrister who uh, specialises in crime and police regulation. Of most direct relevance, I've sat on the APCO child protection working groups for several years, multi-agency groups. And of more immediate relevance, um, Peter asked me a while ago to lead a review of the prevention order regime in the United Kingdom. And although it's in the report that will come out next week, that has leached into recommendations for the policing of extra-jurisdictional sexual crime against children. So I'll come back to it at the end, but there is going to be a relatively extensive co-authored report publicly available next week that will cover in much more detail the points I'll try to cover today in five minutes. So, um, headline points. The point of today's talk is what parliamentarians can do to tackle the sexual abuse of children overseas by British sex offenders. I don't differentiate immediately between tourists and endemic offenders. I think there is a distinction, but not for today's purposes. The short answer for parliamentarians is change the law so far as the regulation and prevention of travel by identified high-risk offenders is concerned. And secondly, there has to be a different approach to the fixed resources for policing this sort of extra-jurisdictional crime. This doesn't mean British police officers on the ground, abroad, in some post-colonial fashion, policing crime. It means constructive, sensitive, but dedicated police resources to promote local investigation of such offending abroad. For my part, I think that is clearly something that can and should come within the concept of international development and be funded as such, which is something that comes up in the report. <coughs> so those are the headline points. Let me whistle stop through um, how the review that is available next week will, will deal with these things. The first is the balance, we would say, between the perfectly legitimate human right to travel. That human right is qualified by what is needed in terms of protecting public morals and health and other considerations. So it is not an absolute right. It has somewhat been elevated as such. As ever with these things, those human rights considerations are put against, compete with in some ways, the obligation on states, and it's on the screen, to take positive action to protect children abroad from this sort of sexual offending. So the recommendations I come to, we would contend, and although labels don't help, I would regard myself as a human rights lawyer <coughs> as much as everyone else. We contend that the human rights considerations here are fully compliant, not least because any order to prevent travel would be made by a judicial rather than executive decision, which is not necessarily the case in all jurisdictions or as a matter of human rights law. Let me cut to the chase. We all know that there are all sorts of international instruments directed at prevention of this sort of offending, and it would be a day's lectures to cover them. I don't intend to. Optional protocols and all the rest of it. There are all sorts of reviews, everything else, internationally that have their place. Actually, what matters is not that high level sort of review process and so on, although it is important and promotes international state accountability. What really matters is the power within the United Kingdom to identify, hopefully by police forces and others sharing intelligence on a, a more engaged basis. The mantra is dare to share post-Bishard.
sharing intelligence, identifying likely offenders, putting that evidence before an independent court with a view to a proportionate restriction on travel. Presently, those, you may think, rather self-evident principles, identify a risk, prove it, get an order appropriately, are simply not the starting point for these sorts of orders restricting travel. It's much more complicated and obstructive than that. Section 114 of the Sexual Offences Act, it follows on from other forms of legislation to similar effect. Just take on board what's on the screen. This is the foreign travel order provision as presently drafted. The first part in quotes is, is not strictly from the statute. The statute says it's necessary to make such an order for the purpose of protecting a person of under 18 years from serious sexual harm. But look at what is needed at the moment. The local chief officer of police, not CEOP, not the CPS, not any other law enforcement agency, the local officer, and these offenders or likely offenders often move around relatively regularly, ahead of any police intelligence. So the local chief officer, by complaint to a magistrate's court, it's a civil process, so the offender gets the complaint at the magistrate's court. There is no power for an interim order. And the offender can just disappear until the hearing itself. It's all funded by the local police force, even assuming they have the intelligence. <coughs> More importantly, the prerequisites to getting a foreign travel order, however obvious the evidence of risk, however unarguable, the evidence of previous sexual offending against children. Unless you have a previous qualifying conviction, in simple terms, previous conviction for sexual offending against children, whatever the intelligence, whatever the evidence, you cannot get a foreign travel order. It is absurd. It's contrary to the interests of international child protection. You cannot even get one of these things on conviction for a child sex related offence. <clears throat> because the second prerequisite is that since the date of the qualifying conviction, the offender has acted again in such a way to give reasonable cause. <coughs> so you can have a conviction for a series of rapes against children abroad, and on the date of conviction, you cannot get such an order. In parenthesis, um, one of the few celebrities accused of this sort of offending not to have an OBE, Paul Gadd, Gary Glitter, convicted in Cambodia, somewhat against prediction, conviction upheld on appeal. Culturally, that was unusual for a white Western offender. It was too high profile. But the only basis on which SEOP was able to get a foreign travel order in that context was that by chance he had consented to a psychological interview with somebody from the Behaviour Management Unit from SEOP. And in that interview, he'd indicated an ongoing interest in children. But for that, there would have been no evidence to meet that second prerequisite. Again, you may think counterintuitive and contrary to the interests of child protection. I have to be very quick, the UK position, protecting children in the UK, sexual offences prevention orders, are available on conviction. But if you don't get it on conviction, the Chief Officer again has to go back, not only with the conviction, but with conduct since the conviction, proved to the criminal standard to demonstrate the risk. Risk of sexual harm orders, in practice UK-based offending only. No previous conviction required, but what you do need is at least two defined contact offences against children. So downloading, distributing indecent pictures of children do not qualify. Contact offending only counts. So, 
you can have a proven rape of a child. Conviction. Even without a conviction, a proven rape of a child. If it's happened only once, no basis in law for a risk of sexual harm. Again, it's quite wrong. Counterintuitive. What's that happened in practice with all these considerations? Foreign travel orders, eight years across the country, 50 in aggregate, of which only 14 are for the full five year period. And you've heard the numbers. There is such a disproportion here that it should be a matter of genuine parliamentary concern. What do we suggest? We suggest a much simplified order on conviction or otherwise, a whole class of different people informed with the best intelligence can make application. No previous conviction required, no other prerequisites, just a simple evidence-led approach based on risk and then real flexibility as to which order is imposed. Simple, fair, proportionate, human rights compliant. That's what the legislation should be doing. In terms of extra-jurisdictional policing, we can deal with this extremely quickly. A national crime agency may change things, but as things stand, there is not a single fixed police officer or other law enforcement officer abroad directed at child protection, not one. And what's needed, surely, is, as the Australians do, <coughs> fixed, sensitive, extra-jurisdictional resources to promote the investigation and prosecution of British nationals abroad for this sort of offending. So resources abroad and here, fixed, national, centralised resource to investigate extra-jurisdictional crime. Presently, largely, it falls on the local force again. Local forces cannot resource it, they have no experience, and it will not be a PCC priority. Next week, this time next week, this report will be circulated. It's a relatively substantial document. Peter commissioned it. ACPO will need to review whether and to what extent it adopts what is recommended. I'm encouraged by what he said this morning. Multi-agency, multi-expertise, hopefully an informed contribution to the debate. Peter's to be uh, commended, if I may say so, for permitting this report, which is intended to be constructed, gives due credit for the legislative changes that Parliament has made, the notification orders and the rest. He's to be commended strongly for permitting this report to be made public immediately for everybody to get their teeth into whatever they think of it.